Everybody, it's me again, Pat Windrow, Cable Easel, part two of a building called Woodland Complex. The part one was the beginning of this painting of a painting within a painting, a painting of a painting of a building with a, a reflection. And so it's all very intriguing and a little complicated, but I think that um, because I try to make things as realistic as possible, I think you might be able to uh, really get what I'm, what I'm playing with here. I'm going to be doing this outer tree which is the, this, uh, it's white pine, by the way, I found out it's not cedars at all, it's white pine, and these are wonderful old ones. They obviously, the complex was built with these things and saved them because the complex is not that old, so these must be trees that have been around for a, for a good long time, and they are, they are really a wonderful proportion. And um, the, um, and the uh, whimsical part, I think, is the fact that they look, uh, that this particular white pine looks like it's coming right out of the building. Uh, actually, the mirrored building is reflecting uh, trees across the way where we were standing while this was being shot. And the, um, this tree is in the complex just on the other side of the building. I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that that's uh, perfectly understandable, except that at this point, in, this, uh, in the life of this painting, it looks very strange. And it may look strange by the time we finish, but it's also extremely strange when you drive by it. So uh, strangeness is the word of the day here. And uh, to explain all this is not as much fun as going and seeing it and experiencing what happens when you fool around with mirrors. Uh, not far from the um, uh, cable station here, there is a very large and, in my opinion, very silly building. It's blue mirrors, pink mirrors, gray mirrors, green mirrors, all sorts of colored mirrors, and they sort of do things things, but they don't do what this one does. This one is, has a wonderful function to it, and if you're interested in mirrored buildings, by all means, um, uh, jazz on over to the Veterans Highway, uh, where it crosses Motor Parkway, and you will see the complex. Mirrored buildings are in around here. It seems to be like a plague. It's caught on, and every building that gets put up has got some kind of mirror on it, uh, which is okay. When it's well done, it's great. When it's not well done, it sometimes is less great, and sometimes it's uh, silly, and sometimes Sometimes it's uh, beautiful. So, uh, as with any other uh, phase of this world, some things work and some things uh, try to work. Uh, but anyway, the, um, my choice of this uh, building is to kind of, uh, as I talk and, uh, and paint, is to talk about uh, the, uh, the architecture of Long Island and how um, some, of it, some of it is making the island uh, more wonderful than it is and some of it is actually making it uh, less wonderful. So, um, the, uh, me as a landscape painter, I, it's almost like protecting my own investments. I want to make sure that whatever I'm going to find a paint around here is going to be appealing. And as you can see, well, on the close-up that you're seeing on the monitor now, this is as close a, a rendering of, this, of that particular uh, tree that I want to see. But um, I think it explains itself, especially if I'm going to put some of those, then I'm going to put a little bit darker, um, uh, the uh, main trunks uh, have a nice sort of a divided uh, look about them here. The um and the trees that are growing in the foreground are going to be the ones that are really going to be tricky to try to pull off because not only does there is the building got tree reflections, but the building also has um, trees in front of it. Uh, as usual, all objects, whether they are as, as um, leafy as trees or whether they are as solid as a cup or a box, uh, they all uh, have uh, a sunny side to them or a light side. Uh, the light side of these trees uh, are picking the uh, sunshine up that is coming from the east. 
because this building faces north. Um, whether or not anybody is really aware of the uh, direction that buildings face, it is vital when you are um, trying to portray something that you make sure that the shadows are right. Because um, not only is a painter uh, an interpreter of the scene around, but they're also something of a reporter. And uh, my reporting had better be accurate or somebody is going to call me on it. Anyway, here in the front of this building, and I'm going to do this with a palette knife, uh, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to introduce the trees that are in the front. Uh, which means I've got to put a little bit of this background color in here to make sure that all of this darkness here is, uh, is taken care of before I begin painting something in front of it. And all of this brush back here is part of a hillside in the back of these big buildings that has been fortunately left wild. Uh, nobody has decided to cut all of this stuff down and um, uh, woe be unto them who tries to think about doing that because um, I, I, I believe that uh, these trees lend a great deal to this particular area. So so, with my palette knife, which is a, which is a wonderful uh, tool, I'm going to put the light side of these trees on with some pure color from my palette. Um, uh, it's called yellow green, and uh, the side of this little pine tree that is in front of the building hopefully will stand out because I'm putting the light side on. The dark side is going to fade off into virtually nothing because the um, the, the, background, the background of the building is so dark, but we've got to get the light side of this little tree in and see if it does, in fact, look like it's standing out in front of it. There is another one over here, slightly taller, uh, just as equally uh, brilliantly uh, struck by the sunlight, and I probably will be able to get the dark sh side of this one in because there is some pale background that will be able to accommodate it. But as you can see, the um, application of this color uh, not accidentally, uh, quite deliberately, I'm putting this on in the shape of the, uh, the pointy branches of these trees. They are not, um, they are not uh, as tall. They obviously were planted after the building was put up, uh, but they are not competing with the great big ones. They are just, uh, they're doing their own thing here. Here's the, here's the dark side of it. And um, as you can see, the dark side is going to blend in with the, the light side. Remembering, of course, that there are uh, two sides to every object uh, when it's lit by any kind of light. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, a tree has got to have the same kind of attention paid to its form as any other object, even though it is, it is leafy and sometimes uh, looks amorphous and not too distinct, but the, uh, the, the dark side of the tree is as vital as the pale side or as the green of it. So here we have two trees in front of this reflected building. I believe there's another one over here and that is catching the light again and uh, against the dark background, the sort of um, the diffused background of the, of the brush in the, in the rear, here is the, uh, here's the, um, the darker side of this tree. This is the sap green right out of the tube, and um, so there is no problem about how to mix these colors. The sap green seems to be a very, um, a very cooperative tone, especially for pines and things. And as you can see, I don't think I need to uh, do any refining on these trees. They are part of a sort of a background. Um, there are cars parked there. I'm going to, well, maybe stick those in a little bit later. But what I need to do is to, is to show you how uh, there are two columns in that building there that are um, part of the support system, I suppose, but also part of the design. And they're, um, they're a pale color. I'm not sure that it really matters what color they are. They appear to be sort of pale blue. And they, um, uh, let me see. They are right behind this little tree, and they come up to about the second floor. So with a brush, um, I'm just going to indicate them very slightly. There's, there's, there's a pair of them. There's a light side to them and a dark side. And I'm going to see if I can blend that to make it look like what they are, because they are cylinders. Um, this is part of the, of the design of the building. Now going across, and I'm going to now have to uh, really bite the bullet and see if I can get this to work, uh, these lines. I'm going to indicate them only very slightly. I'm going to use this as a resting stick. I think I've talked about this once before. I'm hoping that I can pull this off. If I can, this, then you would chalk this all up to a demonstration. But as you see, I'm resting my hand on this brush, and, I, and I'm going, this is not supposed to be an actual architectural drawing. This is just an interpretation of what I see there. I'll put that open window in later. But these are the separations of the, of the, um, of the mirrors. Um, Oops. If you don't get the paint thin enough, it is not going to flow. 
Um, I'm resting my stick in the dark area where if I make a, if, if it shows, it will not be, it, it, well, I mean, if, if I disturb the paint, it won't show too badly. Here are the, um, here are the separations. This is vital for the explanation of this painting. Uh, I believe that it will explain itself, and if it doesn't, well, then I have failed miserably, and we've wasted a lot of time. But um, it's also a lesson to be learned on how you interpret these things, if you decide to do them. Uh, painting beach scenes and so on, and painting all the, you know, reflections in lakes and this and that, is comparatively simple compared to trying to pull off uh, something which is uh, visually uh, as tricky as this is, and also uh, it's uh, such an optical illusion. So, um, but uh, the challenge is, of course, the thing that spurs one on, and as soon as these lines cross the dark area, they become light, which, of course, is what I'm going to do after I finish the dark ones. And um, uh, uh, the, the remark that people make to me when they see me do work, they say, I do not have the patience. Well, um, it isn't a question of having the patience, it's a question of having the technique. If you have the technique, the patience comes all by itself. It's when you don't have the technique that you lose patience and then you become frustrated. So the, um, the business of, of trying to make these lines, um, uh, well, architecturally understandable and, and acceptable is a question of uh, whether or not, uh, if I were doing this in my studio, I would set myself up with all kinds of wonderful uh, ways of being able to make sure that these lines are gonna be straight, but I'm, let me just do them as I talk to you. And and they, of course, change direction. They get a little bit more horizontal as they go towards the center of the building. Well, that's not too bad. Fortunately, I, I don't drink, so <laughs> I can pull this off. Um, I would hesitate to have anybody who has got slightly shaky hands trying to do this. But um, uh, the uh, great fun is to see whether or not you can, in fact, pull it off. And the, um, the, uh, the introduction of the pale lines is going to be the, another one of the telling parts of this canvas. One of, these win one of these windows opens, and I, I, may, I may relieve our, uh, us of, of the uh, torture of putting and making that open window, but then again, I just may put it in. It depends. The uh, wonderful part about being the painter is that you can invent as you go along and eliminate as you go along, uh, except that I like to be sort of fairly accurate and um, uh, take the chance that maybe somebody was driving by the day they were throwing all that junk out of that window, and, <laughs> and they saw it as well as I did. So there are the squares. Now let's see if I can reduce this color. I'm using this, um, I'm using my very fine brush, and I'm going to, and I'm rinsing it off in, in um, um, paint thinner, and I'm going to try to reduce it down to ink-like consistency, which means that I take a lot of uh, paint thinner and I make a puddle of paint thinner on my palette, and um, get, the, uh, get the ink to flow, get the paint to flow, and see whether or not I can, are you seeing me do that? Yeah, I think you are. Here, this is um, a little bit more paint thinner, and you have to keep it uh, really very clean and see if I can pull, get these, uh, get these, uh, you don't have to do many, just, just a little bit to explain what you're seeing. That what you're seeing are these pale, uh, are these pale separations across these dark areas. Hmm, works. Ah, yes. Well, see, all is not lost in, uh, in Mudville. Uh, Millville, no, mud, never mind. These are, I, I, get so, uh, I get so distressed if I find that my, my technique isn't working that I make jokes to cover up for it. But here, are the, here is the general way to do it, and I think that you'll agree that you don't have to have much. Just a suggestion. These things go up higher. These things meet that cross line. And, um, okay, I did not find out who the architect was. Well, some, of, some, of, some, some subsequent show I will be able to find out who the architect was, and then I'll tell you about it. But um, you can do just so much, and if I had gotten his name, I probably wouldn't have been able to remember to tell you anyway. And the, now these, these verticals are going to, uh, going to probably complete the, um, the illusion of this building. If it, if, it, uh, if it does, then good. If it doesn't, then it means I'd have to refine it. And when I do refine these things, of course, I bring them in for the Art for Open Lands show, and then you can see the, um, the difference between the, the pieces that have been done uh, right there on the spot and the pieces that have been reworked. So for the most part, you can tell that, um, that this is, in fact, a div dividing. Here's a little, little bit of pale between here and a little bit of horizontal that. So, well, the, um, the, the, some of them are a little bit too thick. However, uh, okay, we're going to do a little bit, something of a break in the meantime, and I better, uh, the, um, I better get myself uh, cleaned up here with uh, all these colors that have been thinned. And I see that there are some sort of nice little 
leafless bushes in the foreground, a slightly amber toned, and that's going to help some. And I will probably try to work this, uh, this nice column here. So I'm going to break for just a second and uh, come back very shortly, so don't go too far away. You can um, hopefully uh, be able to uh, conclude for yourself that this kind of an experiment is, uh, is not just an interesting one, but it's also very instructive about, the, uh, about how you go about painting your own environment. Uh, I find that many of the painting shows take you to so strange and unknown places with great rugged peaks that possibly have never been seen by the human eye or have been taken out of the National Geographic when some valiant uh, group of cameramen went to the top of the highest point in Tibet and took pictures, but they're not pictures that you would ever be able to paint from life. So I'm thinking that maybe uh, going out and finding these scenes that are here uh, are the more important way to learn how to paint, uh, to, to, to paint the landscape. Uh, here in the foreground, I do believe that there is a, a sort of um, an, an, um, a mysterious and uh, sort of unexplained uh, arrangement of bushes that have turned kind of pink in the winter time. Uh, they have uh, got, maybe even they've got some little buds, but the lower part of this has got some bushes growing towards the, um, against this, um, against this mirrored uh, background, which is very dark because of the fact that it's reflecting the lower part of the scenery. Um, the uh, the darkness here in the in in the uh, in this uh, in these two strange columns is obviously some kind of an opening. But while we're talking about an opening, let me go up to this window here and see if I can make you um, make you believe that there is a window that is open. It is slightly bluer because it's dark. It's a darker one, and it's I believe it's up here. Let's say let's say that arbitrarily it is this window that is open, and it's it's open at an angle, and um, the blue is uh, has turned dark. And let's see, yes, it, um, it, uh, it is the opening in the building, which, is, which I find really <laughs> very difficult to, we, I was surprised and so was the, uh, so the young man that I was with when we did this shoot, to see that this building is in fact open and therefore the fact that this is, um, this is um, a, a genuine opening in an otherwise optical illusion, the branch of the tree that I painted is disappearing because the, uh, it is open. They were, they were obviously throwing things out of here and uh, down would fly great uh, pieces of sheetrock and so on from this uh, from this opening. Uh, uh, so something which I learned uh, and did not know until today that there was in fact a way to open those walls. As I look at the monitor, I see that the the, the door that is open is casting a reflection against the building in the same direction. All right, there it is. So the build so this window has a reflection of its own being reflected in the building. All very, very complicated and almost impossible to explain. Therefore, I wouldn't bother to explain it. I'm just going to paint what I see. Anyway, so there were workmen up there in that building uh, using the opening there. Um, oh, it's perfectly straight. Oh, I see. Mistake, mistake. It's got to be straight. 
Well, anyway, uh, refining will take care of that. Here we have now the foreground, which can make or break a painting. Let's hope it doesn't break this one. The um, palette knife is now going to be called in to put in a great, wonderful final uh, evidence of what um, <coughs> this winter has brought us, namely, a tremendous amount of snow because this is the north side of the building. It still has great patches of snow in the front here, which I like to just sort of put in in a very, uh, in a very simple way with, um, with a nice texture. Uh, the snow is piled up here north. It isn't going to melt for a while. Maybe it'll be gone by the weekend, but for now it's, um, it's still there and it has some nice bluish purple shadows on it coming from those other trees. Uh, as you can see from the monitor, there is an awful lot of um, traffic going on at this place. Uh, here, are some, here are some shadows uh, coming from those trees. Uh, and um, then the next patch uh, next to the snow is a pure uh, yellow green out of the tube. The sun in the winter time and in the early spring sometimes really does a, puts a wonderful look on this thing. It's just nice great spans of brilliant color um, that this is uh, this lawn that um, is now going to be uh, uh, mowed within an inch of its life in a matter of months. There will be mowers out there constantly keeping this grass uh, cut but in the winter time it gives it's given a rest from all that cutting and it gives a nice lift to these otherwise rather dismal uh, landscapes. The, um, the white that I'm going to pull, uh, I'm going to take a squeeze it right out of the tube and I'm going to put it right on the canvas. Um, uh, very heavy because I, love, I like the texture, I like the idea that, um, that the, uh, is, is it turning a little bit green? Yeah, I didn't wipe, the, didn't wipe my palette, uh, my knife carefully enough. This, um, this snow is, is um, still uh, quite thick. And it also then has some nice bluish mauve shadows on it. And here is all this nice, uh, and it makes for a good foreground solving of the problem of foreground, which is, of course, always a problem. Back here in the shadow, there is some, uh, I believe there are some plantings and some green back there, too. So I'll put that in, but tone it down. Not as, not as much brilliant green as I had um, as I had on that other patch. Back here it's a little bit, it's been, it's been uh, subdued a little bit by the fact that this is in the shadow in the north. And here this area back here has got some nice green. So what appears to be a rather uh, monotone uh, painting, it's not. It's not monotone at all. And now I've just discovered something else looking at it sort of closely that in the building there is a reflection of the snow and that's turned rather blue. So back here here is some snow reflected in the building, which makes for another all sort of an intriguing mystery about it. Uh, I don't see it on the other side. So here's a reflection of that, of that particular snow, and here's a little bit of, 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 um, of dark uh, uh, shadows on the snow. Um, as, as I say, painting from life is far more instructive and it's also far more revealing. You get to discover things that you couldn't possibly have either invented or remembered. So uh, here I'm going to put the shadows that are going to be running down this little incline. And this little incline has got trees growing on top of it. I'm going to put the shadows on first. The, um, the fact that these shadows are going to be at an angle tells you that this is in fact a little hill. <coughs> and that these little trees are, are casting little shadows down the hill. Uh, the shape of them, now they need to be there. As soon as I get the trees in, you'll understand that that's what it is. Here is some more shadow along here. So actually a painting that looks quite monotone has turned out to have a nice bit of color in it. Um, or sort of nice Easter egg colors as a matter of fact. And I see that there is also a rather dark space here, which means that some ultramarine blue, a touch of the, a touch of the black, and some of my quick drying Zek is going to, Zek is the, uh, is the dryer that you put in with the dark colors. There is a nice dark kind of row of, of dark green here, uh, not explained but um, helpful. And here's another little row of dark green here, whatever that means, but um, I would never argue with it because it works very nicely and gives a nice feeling to it. The last thing that I'm going to do is to um, uh, uh, palette knife these trees in the foreground so that you can, so that hopefully they will look as though they are in fact in front of everything. 
they also they are also a lot of a lot of them are in shadow, but they um, this one stems from here. Oh, actually, I was mistaken. This little tree back here that I thought was in the foreground is actually the one that's in the in the background. It's actually the one in the foreground. So this little the, this little evergreen here is the one that's casting the shadow, and um, a, uh, the um, the uh, uh, pale color is uh, sort of blends in with the uh, the rest of the of the grass. Let me see the other. One. Yes, there's sort of little darkness is down here. The, um, I don't really ever try to question too hard what it is that I'm looking at because some of it is mysterious and that's the way it ought to be in a painting. A painting should have a little bit left to the imagination. So if I don't see everything absolutely clearly and interpret it that way, then there will be a certain mystery involved in it as well. Um, I'm uh, hoping that you will all go out and grab one last look at this, what I, what I consider an extremely difficult winter. Uh, because before you know, we'll be perspiring and hating it and saying, God, I hate the summer. And we will forget um, all, all about the dull, dull, dullness of the winter time. But in the winter time, there are some wonderful scenes to paint, such as here. And I, I believe I see a little bit of a, of a dark space between the grass and the snow right down there. And uh, that, that always helps a little bit. I don't know why it's there, except that it is. And somewhere here, there is something that has happened with um, oh, so some, I see, they have cleared some of the snow and it's caused a sort of a mound of, of kind of gray, well, we're sort of used to seeing these great mounds of gray snow towards the end of the season. And here, this little, great mo this little gray area here might be a, some, some snow that has, uh, that has not quite melted and has been accumulated from clearing the driveway. So all of these things are, they help to, um, to enhance a picture and to give it mystery and to give it some understanding. I'm not putting the cars in, and that's the end of it. Well, maybe I will. No, I won't. I hate them. I, I don't want. I don't want to to change the look of this landscape. I do, however, see that there are some uh, other little shadows coming right down here, and there are a few other little trees that are uh, against this building just before those pinkish, uh, salmon-colored bushes begin. So, well, we have a very short time left, and um, I keep getting signals that we're running out of time, and therefore, um, it looks like it is my, my obligation to sign off, which I think um, maybe uh, it's time to do. I think that, of course, signing a picture is something that um, is, is, a, is, is important, because, first of all, it'll, sign, it'll name the name of the person that bothered to do this, and also the year in which it was done, so that um, there is not just the identification of the place, but of the time in which it took place. So I always sign a painting with my handwriting, with my uh, with my diluted paint, which is a lot of uh, turpentine and a lot of and a very little pigment. And on this MG drying, quick drying white, it works very nicely. It cooperates. I'm just going to put uh, apostrophe 93, and maybe somebody will remember that in 93 we had that really two remarkable snowfalls, one right after the other. Anyway, painting of a painting of a building with a reflection and so forth and so on. This is, um, this is uh, always fun to do this kind of thing, to see if you can maybe pull it off. If I have, good. If I haven't, I'll try again later. So thanks for watching. I hope you caught this in its proper rotation. This was number two of this study. And so come uh, tune in whenever you can. This is me saying bye-bye.